part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous. And then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel. Because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous, but you have it under control. And, you know, a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. But if you happen to have to get in one, and, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. And so the strength that you develop in your monstrousness is actually the best guarantee of peace. And that's partly why Jung believed that it was necessary for people to integrate their shadow. And he said that was a terrible thing for people to attempt because the human shadow, <clears throat> which is all those things about yourself that you don't want to realize, reaches all the way to hell. And what he meant by that was, it's through an analysis of your own shadow that you can come to understand why other people are capable, and you as well, of the sorts of terrible atrocities that characterized, let's say, the 20th century. And without that understanding, there's no possibility of bringing it under control. When you study Nazi Germany, for example, or you study the Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin, and you're asking yourself, well, what are these perpetrators like? Forget about the victims. Let's talk about the perpetrators. The answer is, they're just like you. And if you don't know that, that just means that you don't know anything about people, including yourself. And then it also means that you have to discover why they're just like you. And believe me, that's no picnic. So that's enough to traumatize people, and that's partly why they don't do it. And it's also partly why the path to enlightenment and wisdom is seldom trod upon. Because if it was all a matter of following your bliss and doing what made you happy, then everyone in the world would be a paragon of wisdom. But it's not that at all. It's, the, it's a matter of facing the thing you least want to face. And everyone has that old... There's this old story in King Arthur where the knights go off to look for the Holy Grail, which is either the cup that Christ drank out of at the Last Supper or the cup into which the blood that gushed from his side was poured when he was crucified. The stories vary, but it's, it's basically a, a holy object, like the phoenix in some sense, that's representation a representation of transformation. So it's, a, it's an ideal. And so King Arthur's knights, who sit at a round table because they're all roughly equal, go off to find the most valuable thing. And, they, and where do you look for the most valuable thing when you don't know where it is? Well, each of the knights looks at the forest surrounding the castle and enters the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And that's a good thing to understand because the gateway to wisdom and the gateway to the development of personality, which is exactly the same thing, is precisely through the porthole portal that you do not want to climb through. And the reason for that is actually quite technical. This is a Jungian presupposition too, is that, well, there's a bunch of things about you that are underdeveloped, and a lot of those things are because there's things you've avoided looking at because you don't want to look at them, and there's parts of you you've avoided developing because it's hard for you to develop those parts. And so it's, it's by virtual necessity that what you need is where you don't want to look because that's where you've kept it. And so, and that's why there's, you know, an idiosyncratic element of it for everyone. Your particular place of enlightenment and terror is not going to be the same as yours, except that they're both places of enlightenment and terror. So they're equivalent at one level of analysis and, and different at another. 
So anyways, back to fiction and, 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 and what it does. It, it distills truth and it, it, it produces characters that are composites. And the more they become composites, the more they approximate a mythological character. And so they become more and more universally true and more and more approximating religious deities. But the problem with that is they become more and more distant from individual experience. And so with literature, there's this very tight line where you need to make the character more than merely human, but not so much of a god that, you know, one of the things that happened to Superman in the 1980s, Superman started out, he's got a heavenly set of parents, but by the way, and an earthly set of parents, and he's an orphan like Harry Potter, very common theme, is that when Superman first emerged, he could only jump over buildings, you know, and maybe he could stop a locomotive, but by the time the 1980s rolled around, like he could juggle planets and, you know, swallow hydrogen bombs and, you know, he could do anything. Well, people stopped buying the Superman comics because how interesting is that? It's like something horrible happens and Superman deals with it. And, and something else horrible happens and Superman deals with it. And it's like, that's dull. He turned into such an archetype. He was basically the omniscient, omnipresent, um, om omnipotent God. And that's no fun. It's like God wins and then God wins again. And then again, God wins. And, you know, so then they had to weaken him in different ways with kryptonite, you know, so green kryptonite kind of made him sick and red kryptonite, I think, kind of mutated him. If I remember correctly, and anyways, they had to introduce flaws into his character so that there could be some damn plot. And that's something to think about, you know. There's a deep existential lesson in that, in that your being is limited and, and flawed and, and fragile. Um, you're like the genie, which is genius in the little tiny, in the little tiny uh, lamp, you know, this immense potential, but constrained in this tiny little living space as Robin Williams said when he played the genie in Aladdin. But the fact that you have limitations means that the plot of your life is the overcoming of those limitations. And that if you didn't have limitations, well, there wouldn't be a plot and maybe there would be no life. And so that's part of the reason why perhaps you have to accept the fact that you're flawed and insufficient and, and live with it and consider it a precondition for being. It's at least a reasonable it's a reasonable idea. So anyways, one of the main characters is the country, the known, the explored territory. We went over that a bit. And it always has two elements. I mean, your country is your greatest friend and your worst enemy, you know, because it squashes you into conformity and demands that you act in a certain manner and reduces your individuality to that element that's tolerated by everyone else. And it it constrains your potential in a single direction and so it's really tyrannical but at the same time it provides you with a, a place to be and all of the benefits that have accrued as a result of the actions of your ancestors and all the other people that you're associated with so there's the good tyrant or the bad tyrant and the good king and those are archetypal figures and that's because they're always true and they're always true simultaneously, you know, which is partly why I object to the notion of the patriarchy, because it's a myth, it's the, it's the, what do you call that? It's the apprehension of a mythological trope, which is that of the evil tyrant, without any appreciation for the fact that the archetype actually has two parts, and the other part is the wise king. And, you know, you can tell an evil tyrant story about culture, no problem, but it's one-sided, and, and that's very dangerous because you don't want to forget all the good things that you have while you're criticizing all the ways that things are in error. That's a lack of gratitude and it's a lack of wisdom and it's, it's founded in resentment and it's, it's very dangerous uh, both personally and socially.